sign. I couldn't believe we'd escape with our limbs intact. But the ship mistress had accepted our conditions, and now the Kigyar Horror Show was behind us. We were alive, and thankfully, clear of the jackal perimeter. I've finished analyzing the atmospheric readings from Ari's data chip. You're helping now. I thought you were a company man. I am, but I knew you were just going to ask Mashak to do it, so I thought it might as well get done properly. Oh. Between these readings and those from the other four colonies, compensating for pre-event weather conditions on each world, a pattern has emerged. A pattern? What sort of pattern? In the days and hours leading up to the anomalies, each planet experienced a specific wave of gravitational and electromagnetic disturbances. So, if we find a planet experiencing those same disturbances, we can predict the next anomaly. Mishok, can you cross-check those patterns against current conditions from local colonies? Already on it. I can only access a few nearby worlds, but there's a match. A planet called Laika 3. Statistically speaking, they're about to have a really bad day. Well, we've got to warn them, help them evacuate, whatever we have to do. Before you set your course, you should know, I've also transmitted my findings back to Oni headquarters. You did what? Shoot him! A heavily populated world is about to be hit by an anomaly that has proven catastrophic. Millions of lives could be at stake. The government charged with their defense needed to be made aware of this. Oni's not gonna save those people. They're gonna let those people die because that's what they do. You know that. Shoot him! Yes, Maya, I do know that. Oni's not going there to save lives on Laika 3 because those lives can't be saved. You don't know that! You should totally shoot him. The UNSC will deploy troops to like a three with the directive of containing the damage. You mean controlling the story? Their efforts will save countless other colonies from unnecessary panic. Unnecessary? It seems pretty necessary to me. I assure you, it is most certainly too late to evacuate any of the major population centers on Laika 3. Those people will die, but others could be saved. We have to at least try. I'd spent years playing the pretend hero, acting bigger than life. I'd always told myself it was just that, an act. But with Bostwick standing in front of me, ready to risk everything, I knew I believed it too. And if I believed it, why couldn't I just live it? What Maya was supposed to do had become so unclear to me, but what Farrell would do at this point, that was the clearest thing in my mind. Set course for like a three. As we came out of slip space, the cockpit window was suddenly filled with blue and green. Like a three didn't just look like Earth. It looked like a perfect Earth. Beautiful and lush, dotted with cities but not overwhelmed. Even Bostwick, who rarely ever found reason to stop and smell the roses, was impressed. Is that all trees? Mm. I wouldn't get too attached. You know, there are people down there, too. Yes, millions of them. Which is why I'm curious how Maya plans to convince all of them to heed the seemingly deranged predictions of Pharaoh, a known terrorist, and then evacuate all of them aboard this 10-seat prison transport vessel. I may not have a physical body, but even to me, it seems like a tight squeeze. You're right. We can evacuate everyone, but we don't have to. If the destruction is anything like the event on Conrad's point, the major damage will be concentrated to one region. We just need to evacuate the people standing right on top of it. I've already started scanning the surface for any irregularities. If the weather patterns are to be taken seriously... The first blast was so sudden, I thought we'd smashed into a stray satellite. But then a message popped up on the control panel. I see you. I see you, Pharaoh. Ilsa. Ilsa Zane. The two-meter-tall Spartan washout and general psychopath with plans for an all-out war against the UNSC. The airstrike had leveled her base and made me her number one target. How the hell did she find us? She must have put a tracker on us. It doesn't matter. She's here now. I tried to think. She had us outgunned, but maybe I could get the slip space drive powered up. But it was already too late. Ah! Just lost engines. Uh, Mishok took to the comms. Um, hi, hello. Hey, a quick question. What if there was someone on this ship that didn't do anything to you and who you weren't mad at at all and... Get out of the way, Mishok. Who's worth a shot? Ilsa, listen to me. Those colonists below, they are all in danger. Another event is coming. And you led me right to it. 
I guess I owe you a thank you, Pharaoh. Whatever's down there has the entire UNSC running scared. And something that powerful will be a nice consolation for the army you took from me. So I'm gonna take control of that thing and shove it down the UNSC's throats and through their guts. And on that note, goodbye, Pharaoh. I threw us into a dead dive as fast as I could, but Ilsa had already crippled most of our systems. Maya, give me the controls. Why? So you can intentionally crash us into the ground? No, so I can save your life. You do not have the ability to land this ship at these speeds and with this damage, but I do. I could hear the burn of re-entry all around me. We hit the atmosphere at an insane speed, and the ship's hull was barely holding together. If the ship explodes, we're dead, but he's fine. He'll just wake up back at Oni. Maya! I promise you, I do not want to see you damaged. You can't land this ship. I can. I could feel the ship heating up around me. Smell the door seals starting to melt and bend. Fine! Go! I turned the navigation controls over to BB and closed my eyes as the G-forces built up inside my body. And then, everything was just... black. Or white i can't remember it's all fuzzy the harder i try the more it slips away the, the only thing that seemed real was fire and then earth and then the sky the next thing i remember was the feeling of cool sheets against my skin then the smell of grass melting snow i didn't want to open my eyes Everything felt so good, safe. For a moment, it felt like it had all been a dream. I was waking up back at the cabin. My dad would walk in any moment and wake me with the quietest whisper. I heard his voice as I opened my eyes. Good morning, dear. The glow of morning sunshine was soft and calm around him. He was standing above me. All I saw at first was that affectionate gaze. I was stuck in his eyes. But the world was coming into focus slowly. And I saw him. Tight, pale skin, scraggly beard, and no eyebrows. I had seen him before, in a video Mishak showed me back at the safe house. Dosk Gevadim, the leader of the triad cult. It's okay, it's okay. You're safe. You're protected. I was trying to piece it all together. The crash. I had survived. The triads must have found me and brought me here. Oh. And then I remembered. I'm lost, Rick. The shock? I jumped to my feet, but it was too fast. My head was throbbing. I fell back to the bed. Slowly, slowly, my dear. Your aching body, your churning mind. You've survived quite a wreck. Been through so much. But you can take comfort now. Your friends are alive. You are alive. Very much so. You're all here, and you're safe. I need to see them. And you will. Very soon. Oh, please, forgive my elation. You, you must understand, the very fact that you're here is not random. Our universe has always been moving us towards a consonance by neither divine puppeteer nor coincidence, but simply by momentum towards inevitability. We've almost reached that vanishing point, and on this final approach, the fruits of that convergence have been ripening exponentially. And now, you come hurtling down to us from the clouds in a screaming bolt of fire. Woo! Boom! <laughs> I saw it, and I fell to my knees, my disbelief surrendering to awe, enraptured by the flames, waiting impatiently for my people to tell me you had survived. And then, when they told me who you were, who I'd known you'd be... I froze. Who did he think I was? That warm, placid smile of his beaming over me, it began to feel chilling and dangerous. This is the day 
The transcendence is upon us, and you, the great Pharaoh, have fallen from the sky itself just in time. Honey. I am humbled to my smallest moments. Just in time. No, 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 no. Shh, 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 my dear, please. Don't speak. We mustn't allow the shimmering nectar of your mind to escape your lips uncaptured for posterity. Join me for the evaluation. You don't realize how much good you're doing humanity right now. I was trying to pull it together, but my head still felt sluggish. And before I knew it, he was taking my hand, lifting me to my feet, walking me out into the bright morning. It was all happening faster than I could process. The triad encampment was spread out in a small clearing surrounded by sparsely wooded forest. A few permanent buildings scattered around, but most of the people there seemed to have just arrived, pitching tents or laying out under the open sky. Everyone, men, women, children, they were all dressed in simple robes cinched at the waist. They smiled with closed lips and bowed their heads as we passed. They all had the same short, flat haircut, their eyebrows shaven, the starry-eyed glow in their eyes. It felt like they were sharing something weirdly private. A few middle-aged men were taking turns rolling down a hill, dancing like children, drenched in sweat. People kept wrapping their arms around each other's waists, pressing their foreheads together, humming. I could have sworn I heard a child crying off somewhere in the trees, but no one else seemed to notice. Underneath all this peace, it, it felt like something was bubbling, churning just beneath the surface, something deep and terrible ready to explode. As Dosk led me through this surreal scene, he, he kept conferring paternal nods to his grateful followers as he went. The crisp air on my cheeks was starting to wake me up, and I realized Dosk had been holding my hand the whole time. I felt nauseous. Did you know that when the Covenant was the eminent power in our galaxy, they were ruled by hierarchies? An order of three prophets ushering in a new age with the blessings of an oracle. These hierarchies were right to sense the continuity and shepherd it along, but in the arrogance of their perlustration, they misunderstood the ancient texts, believing the triumvirate of self to be physical, when in fact, the order of three is within. There is great rebirth coming, my dear. Dosk led me into a small room. Inside, I saw ancient medical instruments laid out on a table. What is this? Just a simple test, without impact or weight. It alters nothing and takes only the imprint you choose to leave. Please, sit. I sat down at the table across from Dosk as one of his followers put some archaic metal contraption on my hands and head. Dosk never took his eyes off me, never stopped smiling. I looked up at the man preparing me for the evaluation. His face was unnecessarily close to mine. Dark circles under desperate eyes, a hard smile cut deeply into his perfectly smooth skin. But his mouth smelt like bile. I held my breath. The magnificence of this day fills my bones with light, and I am humbled forevermore. Thank you for shining, Parson. The man leaned over, kissed Dosk's cheek then backed up against the wall with his hands over his heart. That repulsive smile. What do you know about me, Pharaoh? You're a spiritual leader. Well, those are empty words from faraway judges. What do you know about me? You claim that everyone has three spiritual lives, and you encourage your followers to connect all of them. You tell them that's how they can achieve transcendence, and you believe these anomalies are a one-way ticket. Mm. Very good. But while the words fill your mouth, they do not come from your center. Why do you carry so much resistance to the truth? Because I think you're selling snake oil. Uh, dark, dark that seemed to upset Dosk's disciples. He raised his hand, and they stopped. Please, continue. 
You've created a self-justifying belief system and shrouded it in mysticism. Then you use it to prey on desperate people. I prey on no one. Everyone here has come of their own free will. Everyone here cues off you because your philosophy somehow always requires your personal guidance. That's how you set it up. You're always moving the target, so they always need you. That makes you a predatory charlatan. Actually, you know what I think, Dask? Hmm. Tell me. I think this anomaly is going to come out of the ground, and you're all going to die. I also think that if you don't show me where my friends are right now, I'm going to start tearing this place apart. Dask's eyes darted to one of his followers in the corner. They immediately ushered Mashok into the room. Oh, Mashok! Pharaoh! Hey! Are you okay? Yeah, I'm great. Hey, check out this awesome robe they gave yeah, me. Yeah, that's great, Mashok. Where's Bostwick? Mashok shot a hard glance at me, then suddenly tipped his head in the direction of Dosk and the other triads talking in the corner. Apparently, he didn't want them to wonder where Bostwick was. Oh, Bostwick! Yeah, she's in the fields, helping with the new arrivals. He wasn't being subtle at all. But I still had no idea where Bostwick was. Before I could ask, though, Dosk was right in my ear again. I see all the pain in you, Pharaoh. The great losses you've suffered, living two very different unattached lives. It's time you connect them and embrace your third self. For only then can you truly find peace. How did you know the anomaly was going to hit here? I heard it coming. The transcendence sings to us all, if you'd only listen, my dear. Oh, that voice is a great wailing against the cosmos. And it guided me here with nothing more or less than inevitability. We are about to witness a rebirth for humanity. Those who stand with me in self-accretion will find great peace. He leaned in towards me as his smile faded off his face. And those who cling to their selves will be torn apart. But worry not, my dear. I'm not gonna let that happen to you. His face perked up again instantly as he turned quickly and breezed out of the room with his disciples on his heels. Oh, shock. We need to go now. Okay. As I turned towards the door, I noticed half a dozen men had come and were outside standing guard. Dusk wasn't gonna let us leave. I was scanning the room, looking for another way out. When the men outside started... Moaning. Cry out. Cry out, my sweet children. Yes. Yes. Dosk entered the room again and extended his hand to me. Pharaoh, falling from the sky, rise and join me, for you are among the fortunate who will bear witness. They led Mashak and me out into the clearing. All of the followers were spread around, standing and moaning, arms reaching. I didn't know what they were reaching for until I saw the rocks. Okay, this is not normal. Rocks, pebbles, sticks, they were rising up, floating in the air all around us. I felt my feet starting to get light on the ground. Gravitational interference. It's starting. We need to go. Loose pieces of the world were floating everywhere. Sweet children of the universe. I turned and saw Dosk standing in the middle of the clearing. His followers gathering around him. Suddenly, Dosk was levitating three feet above the grass, his eyes to the sky. Um, are you seeing this? In this liar's plane of causation and particle, our center force is meek and quiet. Just as the gravity that slumps off into levels unseen by organic eyes, unheralded by simian minds, we rise beyond this membrane to the higher spaces. With Dosk suspended in the air above us, I watched as some of his followers started to rise up as well, their feet slowly lifting from the ground. Then Dosk turned and looked straight at me. The end has begun.